So um, my thought was that I would present a few slides to sort of just put uh, the internet in context and uh, really sort of give our perspective. And I think that the presentation, as you can see, is called A Global Perspective 2020. So I sort of tried to draw out some of some interesting and salient facts that uh, might be relevant for us uh, as we sort of then, after this, uh, after this particular session, sort of drill deeper into more tangible things. So I'll start at a very, very high level. Um, and thank you for the introduction, and obviously it's great to be here today. Uh, and thank you for the invitation, Stefan, for, uh, for being here. So uh, let me just uh, jump straight into the presentation to talk about a few key uh, things. Let me see if I get this uh, to work. Right, but... Uh, uh -huh, okay. Here we go. So um, perhaps one, one, one thing that we uh, very often uh, end up talking about in uh, different meetings and different interactions with people is just the explosive growth that we've seen in Internet. Uh, what we show on this slide uh, is the number of Internet uh, users, and, and I think that there are a few interesting things that, uh, that emerge from this slide. So really, Internet has been around um, you know, since the mid-90s, or not, obviously it's, it was around before, well before that, but it was in the mid-90s when you started seeing references in newspapers to websites. I remember reading, reading magazines like Economist and Time, and then you started having those references to the Internet in the mid-90s. So at that time, there were 15 million users on the Internet. By the time the boom was in full swing in uh, the late 1990s, in 2000, you had 350 million people online. But you know, as, you, as, as most of you will recall at that time, it was very, very slow. There was actually relatively limited functionality. You were really consuming media. It was very difficult to, to, to shop online, uh, but we obviously still thought that it was, uh, 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 thought that it was an amazing uh, platform to do different things. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the past 10 years, we've grown from 350 million people to 2 billion people. I actually read, in, in, uh, uh, read somewhere last week that we're now at 2.2 billion people. But it doesn't stop there. So what we have here in 2015, it, 2015 is, the, is an estimation that 5 billion people will be online. 5 billion out of 7 billion, which is quite extraordinary. So the question is, you know, how can that really happen? You know, we've had 1.7 billion people come online in the last 10 years. Can we really get another 3 billion in the next, call it, uh, 3 years? And, and, and we actually believe that you can, because what is happening today is that you have 6 billion mobile phone connections and obviously some people have many mobile phone connections, but we believe that all of these mobile phone connections are actually going to be internet enabled, and more importantly, broadband enabled uh, a few years from now. And I'm not sure if 2015 is the right year, or whether it's 2016 or 2017. What is clear is that every single mobile device a few years from now is going to be an LTE device, fully broadband enabled, giving everyone access uh, to the internet uh, uh, in the world, and obviously the vast majority of the next 3 billion of users are going to be in the developing world. So that's obviously something that makes us and should make all of us who are in the industry very, very excited. So I think that actually there's going to be more change to many more people resulting from the internet than what we've seen in the last uh, 15 years. Um, so moving, uh, moving on to talk about a few other things, I think that another very, very important thing for, again, all of us in the, all of us in the industry is that cost, cost of setting up businesses, running applications, bandwidth cost, etc., has come down dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, I think that the thing that we show up on the top left corner, which is the estimated cost of running an application, has come down from $150,000 to $1,500. It was actually borrowed from a statement made by Mark and Reason. But you look at things like, like, like cost of storing data, price of PCs, uh, obviously memory, price of bandwidth, everything has come down very dramatically, uh, making it much easier for entrepreneurs to start new companies. Uh, and, and, and also, in our view, it also enables these companies to be much more profitable in the long run, as long as you can gain scale and protect your business through some sort of barriers to entry. So remember back in 2000, you had 350 million people online, an enormous amount of capital chasing very few companies, very few of which made, made any profits or generated any cash flows. It's a very different picture today. 
you know, companies that have been around for a few years are profitable and cash flow generative at a pretty early stage. And that's obviously something which is interesting for investors and allows, uh, allows funding of uh, business plans. Um, let me... Here we go. So, um, obviously, another thing which has uh, changed our lives dramatically, you know, are a number of different services that we now use that we didn't necessarily use five years from now or even three years from now. You have Facebook, you have Twitter. Obviously, email has been around for a long period of time. And what has really happened, you know, as a result of bandwidth being, being there and obviously these services enabling people to exchange information is an enormous, enormous increase uh, in data being transferred across the global network. So I'm not going to read out all of these stats, but it's absolutely staggering the change that has taken place, the data which is being, being uh, uh, transferred. I think that a lot of useless data, uh, but also some good data which is, you know, which is becoming increasingly important to sort of mine and analyze in, uh, in, in the right way. So this is something that we're, we're, we're quite focused on. Second point that Mark Zuckerberg has made is that what has happened in the last few years is that people have just become much more uh, acceptable to sharing information about themselves. Um, perhaps not the older generations, but certainly for the younger generations, they, you know, they have absolutely no qualms about sharing a lot of information with their friends. I think that many of these services, they enable you to also protect your privacy if that's something that you want to do. But many people, especially the younger generation, they sort of seem to be happy to share a lot of uh, information. So it's going to be interesting to see what important uh, information media can unearth on presidential candidates 10 to 15 years from now when their whole lives are on Facebook's uh, timeline. Um, moving on to talk about something which is sort of more tangible from an industrial perspective, and that is really the internet as a disruptive force across many, many different industries. And, you know, 15 years ago, it really started with media, uh, newspapers and magazines getting competition online. Um, then I think that, you know, communication was started to be impacted by by, by services like uh, Skype, Skype, etc. But now we see, you know, more and more industries, you know, be it healthcare, obviously music, financial services, and, and, and importantly, e-commerce, which we are very focused on, you know, they're all completely being disrupted by, uh, by internet. And I think that we're just seeing the start of this. Everything will pretty much be uh, impacted by uh, internet in a very, very fundamental uh, way. And I think that we're really in early innings still in this uh, process. Um, the other interesting thing uh, which has happened in the last few years is that uh, many companies are actually growing faster than we've ever seen before. Uh, good examples are Groupon and Zynga, and, and obviously both companies have actually used Facebook as a platform to achieve, to achieve that growth. So I think that based on uh, our research, uh, Groupon was the fastest company to ever get to a billion dollars of revenues and two billion dollars of uh, revenues. And I think without using Facebook as a way of targeting uh, customers and as a platform, they wouldn't have uh, achieved that. Same thing obviously goes for uh, Zynga. Another, another interesting uh, fact here is that Facebook, it took them 45 months to get to their first 50 million users, but then to get to the next 700 million, uh, to gain the next 700 million users, it took them the same 45 months. And now, you know, they're probably close to hitting uh, 1 billion users in the next, uh, in the next, uh, few months. Uh, so what the internet enables you to do is reach an enormous amount of people in a highly targeted way, and that was clearly not uh, possible before. So if you think about just some of the ramifications of this, say, you know, five, five, ten years from now, you have five billion people, five billion people online, you know, you don't need to get the penetration that you need for a company to be successful can be very small. You know, you need to need, you, you, you can reach you know, 1%, 1 of, uh, of that population, and you already have 50 million users. So, you know, we see a number of exciting things that will, uh, that will inevitably come out of this. So, um, to move on and sort of talk a little bit about, um, I think I'm going to focus for a few slides on advertising and e-commerce. So that's obviously where a lot of the uh, dollars today are being uh, generated. So in 2000, it's interesting, I think that in 2000, there was something like $50 billion being raised for new companies, both in private market and public markets. 
but that 50 billion dollars of fundraising was basically chasing companies that were going after 8 billion of advertising revenue. So no wonder that that market came crashing down in 2001 and 2002. Today, the, the online advertising market is around $72 billion. And the, just to put it in context, I think that the global advertising market, if you include outdoor advertising, newsprint, magazines, radio, TV, I think that it's around $500 billion. So obviously, the penetration is still relatively low. We expect that to grow to $2 billion. So, to, sorry, $200 billion. So $200 billion out of $600 billion, that's still one-third in uh, 2020. So, um, you know, a lot of things will uh, still change. And obviously, what all internet companies need to figure out is that they need to think about how to monetize that, that advertising in a, in, a mobile, in a mobile world. And I think that there's no doubt, you know, be it Facebook or Twitter or any of these companies, they will figure it out. At the end of the day, advertising dollars follow eyeballs, and they follow eyeballs where, where those eyeballs actually spend, uh, spend time. So I think that this is inevitable. Uh, let me see here. So, um, just looking at one of uh, you know one other fact as it relates to uh, advertising is that it's obviously the cost structure is very different. You, know, you look at New York Times or Time or any really sort of shall we say traditional media house, their cost structure is very different to a Google or Facebook. They obviously have content costs that they have to that they have to fund. They have to invest in selling and marketing at a, com at a completely different rate of sales or percentage of sales than uh, online players, which result in very different uh, very different profitability. Um, so I think that this. And by the way, I'm not sure if uh, Facebook and Google will be able to sustain this sort of profitability over time. I think that that profitability will come under pressure as a result of competition. But it's very clear that you know if you have those sort of margins, you know you can deploy a lot more money into investing in the in the business. And again, I don't think that this was the case ten years ago. Now this industry is really coming, coming maturing to to uh, to uh, profitability. Um, what we also see uh, and what we follow very closely is e-commerce around the world. We think that it's it's, it's it's disrupting retail for sure in the Western world but also increasingly in the developing world, where a number of consumers are actually leapfrogging from, from, from off online, re oh, sorry, offline retail to on online retail directly. For example, in uh, China, where they don't really have a mall infrastructure, they don't have a main street retail infrastructure to the same degree that you have in Western Europe. Uh, internet penetration in, in retail, e-commerce penetration, is already, according to some sources, higher than in the U.S. So people are just going online uh, in a much more active way than they even do in the developing world. And and and, and obviously, as we show on this page, some of these e-commerce players they 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 obviously have a sustainable cost advantage, given that they don't have to um, they don't have to um, have warehousing space, they don't have to have uh, space for uh, retail uh, retail outlets. So if you look at um, if you look at the next slide and just look at uh, e-commerce as a percentage of total retail, uh, in 2011 it was around 6%. We believe that by 2020 it's going to be uh, 20% and by 2030, 15%. So the numbers are obviously very, very dramatic. If someone had told me five years ago that I would be buying shoes online, uh, I would have told them that they were crazy. But now our whole family is buying shoes and apparel and we all thought that it would be impossible to buy uh, clothing online, and, and now that's obviously happening. Uh, in London, everyone is shopping on uh, Ocado. You know, no one goes and buys their groceries anymore. So we think that this is obviously going to change a lot of uh, a lot of our uh, sort of daily daily habits. So um, trying to summarize a few things before uh, we we continue with questions, we sort of make a number of different predictions. Uh, for the next several years. So we believe that a few years from now we're going to have more than 5 billion people connected to the internet. Uh, we're going to have 20 billion plus devices uh, connected. So you obviously notice it in your daily life that you have mobile phone, you have a laptop, you have an iPad. You know, in your family you may have you know, many of these uh, devices and people fight over these devices. This is obviously what you have in the developing world today. Uh, in the developed world today, we think that this is going to be a global phenomenon. 
uh, a few years from now. And it really becomes the most, and especially in the developing world, having your mobile phone or your tablet is really by far your most important device. That's how you access information in, 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 a, in, in, really, in many cases, in, in really the only way uh, compared to us who probably have more choice in the developed world. We also think that internet is going to be the largest medium, uh, advertising medium, it's going to surpass TV uh, uh, probably in five to ten years from now. We believe that 20% of retail uh, is going to be e-commerce a few years from now. That's two and a half trillion out of probably 12 trillion in uh, total today. Uh, internet sector market capitalization, total global market capitalization is around 35, 40 trillion. Uh, it's roughly one trillion in internet. Our prediction is that it's going to be three trillion. Um, five to ten years from now, comparing that to telecom, which is around three and a half trillion. So we still think that there's a lot of value creation to take place in uh, in internet. Uh, and then we think that there are going to be a number of companies which are going to become very, very large. Uh, you have companies in China such as Baidu, Tencent, uh, Alibaba, three companies which are already each worth more than uh, 50 billion, up from probably not worth more than uh, one billion eight years from now. So you sort of see this dramatic, dramatic value creation uh, in this sector. And that's obviously one of the reasons why we're quite excited to try to help founders and try to help, try, try to help companies to, uh, to get capital in order to take advantage of the opportunities that Internet offer. So uh, that was what I uh, wanted to say. Um, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, John. Um, we'll open the the floor for questions. So if you have any, uh, please feel free. Uh, we have a little bird with the, the wall, so we'll uh, do that in real life, with the, like in the old economy. Uh, I'll start, <laughs> the moderator privilege. Uh, I have a double question. Uh, can you give us uh, your uh, vision of, uh, you, you say the, well, you, you see that the internet will be the largest advertising medium with $2,000 billion spent in the next uh, years. What's the share of the social media advertising? Do you have uh, something in mind? Or, uh... I think that it's, uh, it's a great question, uh, and it very much depends on how you uh, how you define it. I think, you know, sort of off the top of my head, I know that uh, Google today, Google today probably has something like 40 to 50% share of the total market. So if you remember the slide that I showed you earlier on, last year there was probably around 70 to 75 billion spent online. Uh, advertising spent 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 uh, uh, online. 40 to 45 percent of that was uh, Google. Facebook was around five percent of that. Uh, Twitter, you know, probably, you know, around 0.5 percent. So if you say that those two companies, you know, are sort of between five to six percent, I think that that can easily grow to 20 percent uh, in the next uh, in the next few years. And I think that that's just Twitter. <laughs> And Facebook. I think that there are many other companies that will, one way or another, uh, try to uh, try to capture that uh, social aspect and sort of you know by by, by using different social uh, functionality uh, grab more of that. So I would probably say you know at least a quarter is going to be social media of that uh, of that form of advertising. Right. Any question in the in the hall? Uh, I'll ask a second one then. Um, you work in Hong Kong in the Asian offices of uh, DST. Uh, what do your uh, daily work, daily uh, search for investments, uh, teach you about uh, how the uh, internet and social media uh, industry evolves and evolves in Asia? Uh, what, what do the Asian businesses can uh, teach us about uh, the evolution of the global industry? Yeah. So it's quite it's quite interesting when you look at. Um, many parts of uh, Asia outside of China, uh, Twitter, Facebook are actually very, very dominant forces. So I'm not sure if I get the rankings quite right, but I think that Indonesia is the second biggest market for Twitter in terms of registered users. I think that it's the fourth biggest for Facebook. So I think that Facebook and Twitter, they obviously don't monetize a lot in those countries, but you have an enormous amount of users. And it's the same thing across Southeast Asia. So if you look at Malaysia, if you look at Thailand, uh, both Twitter and Facebook are very important companies. Um, if you then look at uh, China, it's obviously you know, a little bit different because Facebook and Twitter, you can't even log on to those. 
uh, in, uh, in China. So the government has, has decided that they're not going to allow its citizens to, um, to, to get onto those services. But there you have very strong homegrown companies. So you have, for example, Sina Weibo, which is a Twitter-like service, which has something like 300 registered users, I think 25, 30 million daily, daily users, and which is an extremely popular way of accessing information. And I think that Sina Weibo's importance in China even outweighs Twitter's importance outside of China. Um, so I think that social media and, and, and Tencent, which is another big, uh, big in, uh, internet company in uh, China, they have all kinds of sort of social features uh, in their vast offering of different, uh, different internet services. Um, a lot of what both Tencent and Weibo are doing is very much sort of socially, socially driven. So I think the interesting thing is that if you look at some of these big companies like Twitter, and Facebook dominating the rest of the world, what you have in China are sort of local, local companies that offer similar functionality. I think all of this, by the way, is rapidly evolving. So, you know, the services that these companies are offering, you know, the product development is absolutely astonishing. So I think that we're going to see a lot of changes in the next, uh, in the next years. And the local companies, they offer the same services? They, or do they have a, a local approach, a different strategies that could be useful to uh, anyone who will try, try to uh, yeah, so, so I don't think that, I think that Facebook and Twitter, and by the way, I think we should let those companies talk about their plans, uh, and, and I think we have someone from Facebook, uh, Facebook coming up after, uh, after me in, uh, in, in, in Xavier. Uh, but I think that generally speaking, most of these big global platforms, they don't really, they don't really localize their offering that much. Obviously, you know, the website is, you know, looks the same, etc. You have different languages. Um, uh, but I think that what will happen is that, that, that the users that obviously generate a lot of content themselves, they are sort of by default making them more local. Any question in the room? Please raise your hands. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, on this 20% of retail that would be online, uh, what would you expect uh, the percentage to be from uh, mobile? from actual mobile sales, and are there any specific uh, key drivers that would actually uh, be able to, to reach at that level? That's a great uh, question. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, have a, a crystal ball, but if you think about your own usage, uh, what I found with small devices is that it's actually quite difficult to shop. I think that what is critical for e-commerce to take place is that you have to have you have to be able to do your shopping with as few clicks as possible you know if you have to go through you know 10 different pages you know fill in your fill in your credit card information your billing information you're just not going to do it on a mobile device unless you have a lot of time to kill so i think that one of the key things for e-commerce because i think that the bandwidth is already there and it's certainly going to be there over the next few years so that's not really an issue. You will have the bandwidth and you will have the speed to go from page to page. But what, what I think is important uh, that you have is that you have, you know, a smooth sort of payments payments platform, uh, payments platform, and that you and that websites basically try to focus on how to deliver goods and services to the customers uh, with as few clicks as possible. You know, I think that that's the absolutely uh, critical thing, and that's 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 essentially why why Apple. Uh, you know, with its iPads have been so successful, you can actually, you know, buy applications and you can do different things with very few clicks. Next question. There. Please give us your, your name and, and company if you, if you want. Hello, thank you for presentation. I'm Francis Solon. I founded Sarenda in, here in France. Copycat of Zappos, so the number one of, um, shoes reseller in France. Um, I have a question about um, the share of e-commerce online, and uh, you can see a sort of movement in France for two or three years with some pure players, e-commerce pure players, who goes in real life with retail stores. Uh, do you think it's going to continue, or is it something we just see here in front of our new app, and you have some other examples for that kind of companies who just not continue to sell online, but tries to have some retail stores? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question again. I think that uh, what we will see is that I think we will see a lot of offline players, offline today, 
you know, have obviously an online offering. And, and, and I think that many of these companies will try to use some of their offline retail presence, for example, just in terms of stores, to support that online, online growth. However, I think that in our experience, the most successful e-commerce companies are the ones that are not shackled by sort of existing offline presence, where they can just sort of focus on the online uh, component. And I think that they can be more nimble, they can be more quick. And obviously, just from a cost advantage point of view, if you don't have to support that uh, retail, sort of physical retail infrastructure, you have a permanent, uh, permanent cost advantage. Perhaps one other thing to mention about e-commerce as well is that unlike other areas like search where Google completely dominates or, or uh, you know, Facebook dominates, dominates the social market to, to a certain degree, what we believe is happening in e-commerce is that we're going to have many, many different players succeed. And, and, and through sort of positioning, you can actually be successful in certain niches. So one thing which I think is quite striking, we all think of Amazon as being the dominant e-commerce company in the US. But as a matter of fact, they only have 12% of the US e-commerce market. So Amazon, this dominant company, only has 12% of the e-commerce market. So our view is that there's actually going to be room for many players in e-commerce and you're not going to have one or two or three players that will capture all of the market. There's room for many companies to thrive in e-commerce and that's, I think, quite different from many other categories in, uh, in the internet world. Great, another question in the back. Hi, Eric Motillon, you mind first. Um, you have a, lot, a very big market share for e-commerce in the US. We can suppose you can get the same in Europe, but uh, according uh, on Facebook, you, you have, uh, with no identification, clear identification and segmentation, children and adults. Uh, what should be your recommendation for a company looking to make um, advertising on e-commerce on Facebook to be sure and secure that the price she pay or it pays for advertising is really addressing the right target on the right people on the right level of age and segmentation. Uh, so I'm not I'm not 100% sure if I uh, if I'm answering the answering the right question. But I think that obviously what Facebook allows you allows companies to do is target customers in in uh, a completely um, you know in a way which is just very fundamentally very different from what we've seen before so if you think about Groupon for example going into new markets if they hadn't had Facebook to target customers with offerings you know when they go when, when they went into a new city they just wouldn't have been able to uh, build that business so I think that there's no doubt that many companies will use Facebook uh, in, in reaching customers and I think that in particular from a local perspective you know, I think that that's really the thing to stress. I think that it's, to a certain degree, sort of less important for very, very large companies to have a presence on, uh, on, on, on Facebook. And I'm not sure if it's, that's necessarily the, the, the most effective way of them creating brand awareness. But what I do think is that for local companies to reach sort of relevant, uh, relevant consumers for them, I think that it can be of real importance. And again, uh, if you think about it, I think that we're again just in, in, in early days. We're going to, I, I think that we're going to see a lot more local companies, you know, especially younger entrepreneurs, be, be basically use Facebook to target consumers in a you know highly targeted way, and hopefully in a cost-effective way uh, as well. <laughs>